Are we on? Yep. Good evening, everybody. Whoa. And how's Deacon? Is he okay? I'm doing all right. Yeah. So, yep. we will start with a prayer and then we'll continue. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We pray that you be with us tonight as we share a little more on our faith. May, uh, may this time be fruitful and beneficial to us as we learn more about uh, what we believe in and pray that you bless us in all that we do. We ask the intercession of Our Lady as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Because the ultimate authority in every parish is the pastor of the parish who, again, shares in that role of teaching, governing, and sanctifying as well, in some ways. So the priesthood is joined to the Episcopal order. It's linked in a very special way, and, and is linked in communion with his bishop. And in the local <coughs> parish, it is the priest through which we receive the sacraments, particularly Eucharist and the sacrament of confession of the sacrament of reconciliation. It's through the priest that we receive those sacraments. And so the priest is the one that's ordained to basically stand in the place of the bishop in the local parish. Any questions on that? And again, among priests, we also have a little bit of a ranking, right? Because you, you have a monsignor, right, or a canon, right? Um, you know, like monsignor, whoever, right? That's just a priest with a fancy title, and they call them prelates of honors. It's like you know, he got uh, the church's equivalent of the you know order of Canada or whatever, and he's been like you know 50 years a priest, and they give him a nice little bonus in that. So, so there we are. Any questions on that? I think priesthood is pretty common that we know more or less what they do and what they're about. So they share in, in, that, in that. I'll read the little summary in the catechism from paragraph 1595. There's lots of paragraphs on the priesthood, but this one sums it up. I can find my... Did I take my paper out? Oh. Okay, 1595. Priests are united with the bishops in sacrum, in, no, in sacerdotal, that means priestly, in sacerdotal, sacerdotal, sacerdotal dignity, and at the same time depend on them, on the bishops, in the exercise of their pastoral functions. They are called to be the bishops' prudent co-workers. They form around their bishop the presbyterium, which bears responsibility with him for the particular church. And the word particular church means the diocese. They receive from the bishop the charge of a parish community or a determinate uh, ecclesial office. So they in a parish or some type of ministry in the diocese. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now again, when we go back to the word <coughs> order, in the church we have two, generally two kinds of priests. You will have priests that belong to a diocese, so you call them a diocesan priest. Okay. We used to we use the word secular priest, although that sounds kind of bad, like he's a pagan or something, but a secular priest. And then the other kind of priest is what? Freelancer. No. <laughs> that's, that's illegal, actually. Really? Not like civilly illegal, it's in church law illegal. In canon law, it's illegal to be freelance. You have to be in the chain of command somewhere. So, you have a diocesan or secular priest, or a 
religious. Is it religious? Pardon? <laughs> well, that's why using these words sound funny, because of course he's going to be spiritual, but what I mean by religious is a religious border priest. <laughs> So, some priests belong to religious orders. You have your Franciscan priests, your Jesuits, yeah. your Dominicans, your Redemptorists, your uh, whatever. There's hundreds of religious orders in the church, right? Mm -hmm. And so, a priest can belong to a community of brothers, so like a religious order. Or he belongs to a diocese, and he's not part of a religious order. Generally speaking, a religious order priests will live in community. Some diocesan priests tend to live on their own. But they're in charge. Most parishes are run by diocesan priests. Religious order priests often go into other types of ministry outside. Some, uh, many religious orders have parishes, and many of them work in parishes as well. But also religious orders often, like the Jesuits, are involved more in things like education than they are in parish ministry. Some religious orders are involved in preaching or in hospital ministry or whatever. They might specialize in certain things. Um, so you have a choice when you're being a priest to say, well, I want to be part of the order of well, when helping you're, in the hospital or helping... Okay, well, the, okay, you're looking at two different things. One is, will I... If I want to be a priest, will I be part of a community? Do I want to, like as a young man is, is thinking of, 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 of his vocation, is to think about, well, is he interested in being part of a religious order? Like, does he want to be a Salesian or a Jesuit or a Dominican? And so we might go and visit them and say, yeah, I think I want to be a Franciscan or I want to be a Redemptorist or an Oblate, right? And so he joins one of those religious orders because he feels a call to live that spirituality, because the religious orders all have their own little flavor, right? Or whatever different, little, little bit of a different accent and work that they do, or, or their history and their own spirituality. Or they want to be a diocesan priest, where they simply want to belong to the diocese, and they don't want to belong to a religious order. So we have those two kinds of priests as well. So what's more popular in the last 50 years? Oh, it's Somebody's... probably even. Oh, really? Yeah, it's probably very even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it the same thing for nuns, or do all nuns have to belong to an order? Nuns? Yeah. Well, among, among nuns, you actually, there's a difference technically between a nun and a sister. Nun is the same as monk. So a monk is in a, they're both in religious orders, but a monk is in a cloistered community, mm -hmm. like a Trappist, mm -hmm. right? And a nun, we use the word nun even for nuns that are work in schools and that, and like, and uh, even the gray nuns aren't really nuns in that strict sense, because they're not cloistered. They're technically called a sister, but be that as it may. Yeah, so a, a woman who's interested in going into a religious order, wants to consecrate her life, she could choose to be what's called a consecrated virgin, and that's sort of like a diocesan nun. Like, there's two women in my parish who are consecrated virgins who don't belong to a religious order, but they live the life of consecrated life to God as celibate women. Uh, it's basically the same thing as a sister, except they're not in a community. So, sure, that little bit of an option there, too. Okay, I'm going to stop with the priesthood there because I want to keep moving. Is this a good time to take a break? Yeah, we'll take a break before we get to the best part. <laughs> Lunch. <laughs> Did you turn me off? Whoop, you're stopping. Where were you when we said break? Yeah. We've got to get to the best part. Ooh. I like, I'm thinking my answers are the best part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's your dad's. Your, 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 your you're on. Okay, he's making us go back. So we'll gather everybody back. So hopefully this evening what I've done is a slow build-up. Okay, we did the bishop, 
Okay, we know what a bishop is. A bishop is the one in charge. And the bishops collectively are the ones in charge in communion with the head bishop, who is the pope. the pope of the Catholic Church. There are other churches that use the word pope, by the way. And in, uh, let's say, six, seven, eight centuries, a lot of major, because pope just means papa, right? I mean, heck, you, when every time you call a priest father, you're saying pope, because you're saying papa, right? So pope just means papa. And uh, in fact, in some languages, Pope is Papa, right? <laughs> Papa Francisco. You say Papa, Papa John Paul, or whatever. So Pope just means Pop, right? And uh, so, like for example, the the uh, Coptic Church in Egypt. Uh, Coptic simply means Egyptian. So the Egyptian Church in Egypt, uh, the Coptic Orthodox Church, um, <clears throat> the head of their Pope, the head of their church, has the title Pope. And then earlier the other the other day, just this week, uh, Pope Francis met the Pope of the uh, an Orthodox Ethiopian Church, and his title is also Pope. So I like them all to get together, you know, the retired one, Benedict and Francis, and some of these other ones. So they have their their Pope support group, you know, because being Pope, you know, is is a tough job. So they need support with each other. So they have Pope's Anonymous meeting, I think. So, talked about bishop, we talked about priest, we'll talk about, say, the best for last. And that is? The deacon. The deacon. <laughs> Yay, the deacon. Can Galbraith go, right? <laughs> Galbraith is going to be the deacon. It's in red. Ooh. <laughs> that means double. It co costs a lot of money. <laughs> I think it's lipstick. Okay. <laughs> what? It looks good. It looks good. <laughs> so, the diaconia goes back to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, I think it's in chapter 5 of the book of Acts, the apostles were saying, hey, we're, we're called to go out and preach and all that stuff, and we're here taking care of some of the practical things. We need some <clears throat> men set aside for the practical things in the church. To take care of the widows and the orphans and those in need. To, to do that kind of hands-on ministry. So they ordained seven men. So one of the ones that we'll know is St. Stephen. right? St. Stephen was the one who was stoned to death that St. Paul witnessed just before Paul's conversion. Well, St. Stephen was a deacon as well as a martyr. So a deacon was, is ordained for, for three purposes. They all start with W. He's ordained for word. A deacon is one who proclaims the word. Okay. A deacon is ordained to assist in worship. Okay. So a deacon has a role <coughs> in mass, right? And the deacon has a role with works. Okay? And it's, connect, and it's this that the word diaconia is connected, because diaconia means like a servant, or even, I'll, I'll translate it modern, you know, I'll, I'll do a really modern translation and call it a waiter. Okay? The deacon is the waiter or the busboy. The deacon is the one who serves. The model for the deacon is Christ the servant who washed the feet of his disciples. That's the model for the deacon ministry is Jesus who washed the feet of the disciples and there and so the deacon is the sign the sacramental sign of Christ who came to serve. Now, deacon is not a sacerdotal ministry, so he's not connected to the priest and the bishop in that sense. I cannot, that's why I cannot celebrate Mass or hear confessions, because a deacon is not a sacerdotal ministry. It's a ministry of service that's different than the other two. The other two are more closely linked. 
one of the one of the ways you'll notice that is in the ordination of a priest the bishop will lay hands on the priest or on the candidate to priesthood and ordain him and then after the bishop has laid hands what happens after that remember what happened to your brother all the other priests that are at the mass will come and they'll lay hands on the on the new candidate that they kind of share in the ordination of the priest the ordination of a deacon only the bishop lays hands on the deacon and ordains him the other deacons don't come around and do that the meaning is the, the deacon is the spe associate specially linked to the bishop but in the ministry of being a servant so my role in the liturgy is meant to appear to be the servant in the liturgy my role so my role in the word is to serve is to preach yes is to assist at mass okay and to be a sign of Christ the servant And so that's the, the threefold part of the ministry of the deacon. How this looks, okay, the deacons and theologians and all that argue over what that's supposed to look like. In my own opinion, it's like, we'll do these in different ways. Every deacon is different, just like every priest and every bishop has his own temperament and personality and own interests, you know. Um, so, for example, you have deacons that might do a lot of preaching, uh, deacons who might do a lot of ministry in the liturgy, right? And you have deacons who do a lot of work among the poor and the needy. We should have a little bit of all three, but the accent might be different, depending on what we're involved in. Obviously, what I'm doing here in teaching the class is still a work, right? Like one of the uh, one of the seven spiritual works of mercy is what instructing the ignorant. Well, that's what I'm doing, right? So that's what I'm doing. I'm instructing the ignorant. I didn't write that one. I didn't make that one up. Yeah, but you laughed. I know. It's fun. <laughs> so, for example, in the mass. It's the deacon that will prepare the altar. It's the deacon that cleans up after. Why? Because that's a, that's a liturgical symbol of the deacon as the servant. I'm not the priest's servant, I'm the community servant, right? Mm -hmm. And so by my, the symbolic act of me preparing the altar and me cleaning up, at least in my own mind anyway, I've never read it anywhere, but I see it as it's a sign that I am, as deacon, called to serve. Isn't that what the altar boys are doing? A little bit too, but they're not ordained at all. Okay, But notice that I do something a little different than them. I'm at the altar. An altar boy shouldn't do that. It just brings us back to you. To the priest, if there's no deacon. Yeah. Sometimes they'll get them to do that, but... <clears throat> But I'm ordained to, to do that. So the at, altar boy won't do the homily either. So at your church, is there still an altar boy? Yeah. Yeah, they have their own role. Like, they'll bring the stuff to me, and I prepare okay. the altar. Okay. Right. Can you briefly talk about all the different religious, uh, holy orders, religious orders, and attach an education to it? If you want to be a priest, this is what you need. If you want to be a deacon, if you want to be... Cardinal, whatever the case may be, even the Jesuit, because you always Jesuits, you always hear of them having a higher level of education than most holy orders. No, I don't know. That's a religious myth. orders. Pardon me. Religious orders. Or religious orders. Okay. So I don't know if that makes. Hang on. Let me let me finish the deacon part. Okay. Okay. There are there are, there are two different kinds of deacons. In addition to the many, like you'll have deacons that are part of religious orders, right? And you'll have deacons that are part of, that belong to a diocese. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about there's two main types of, of deacons. If you meet somebody and they say, I'm deacon so-and-so, okay, you're going to find 
that they're either what's called a permanent deacon or a temporary transition or transitional deacon. But as far as while they're a deacon, a deacon is a deacon is a deacon. So their role, their function, what they do, what they can't do is exactly the same. They have the same rank. A deacon is a deacon is a deacon. All right. Now, the difference is, what's a transitional deacon? On the way to priesthood. That's right. On the way to priesthood. Permanent deacon is one who has chosen to be a deacon, you. like me. Now, the church allows who to be a permanent deacon? Married men. And who else? Unmarried men. That's right. Only two kinds of men, right? Married men and unmarried <laughs> <laughs> So, at the level of permanent deacon, you can have married or celibate. Personally, I'd rather sell a lot, but that's another story. So, permanent deacons can be married men or celibate men. All right. A transitional must be celibate. Because... The church requires our priests to be celibate. Now, if that were to change, like the Orthodox Church has married priests, then you would have to be married before ordination, before you're even ordained a deacon. So before you're even a transitional deacon, if we had, or for example, we do have married priests in the Latin Rite who are converts. So you take someone who was an Anglican priest or, or a Lutheran minister and they convert to the Catholic Church and they request to become a Catholic priest and they're married, there is provision in church law for a married minister who converts to become a Catholic priest. All right? Keep his wife, believe it or not. I don't know why you would want to keep your wife, but, you know, I guess he loves her or something like that. Or for the sake of the children, they'd stay together, I guess. Anyway... So he keeps his wife, right? But he ha obviously he would have to be married before he becomes a deacon. So when he converts, he would be ordained a deacon and then ordained a priest. So that would happen for those as well. So you're always, you always, uh, once you're ordained, you remain the way you were before. But generally speaking, the permanent deacons are normally the only ones married among the clergy. Is the, is the permanent deacons. If we ever open it up to married priests to more people, they would still have to be married before ordination. So a transitional deacon would be celibate. If you get married after you're ordained, you have to step down from functioning in that ordained ministry. Just the way it is. As a deacon as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Once you're ordained, you have to remain the way you are. If I wanted to get married, it would be just as, just as much like a priest who wants to get married. He'd have to, I'd have to step down. As, even though there are married deacons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you step down, get married, come back? No. Not unless I got rid of her somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay? But if I want to stay married, then I step away from being, you know. Say if you married and she died. Then I guess I could come back. Sure. Okay, and then I got lost about if you had a Lutheran minister, okay, a Lutheran minister, they're allowed to marry. Right. And then, so he's married with his wife. Yes. And he steps down from the Lutheran... He converts, becomes a Catholic. Becomes a Catholic. Right. And then he asks the bishop, I, I want to become a, a priest. priest. Okay. The, the bishop can allow him to become a priest. He'd have to go through classes and learn what the Catholic priesthood's all about and stuff like that, of course. Um, but he doesn't get rid of his wife. 
No, he can, he can be married. And that's since 1948 that the church has allowed uh, converts, clergy converts, to become uh, priests that way. Unless you were Catholic before. Well, yeah, I'm talking, you can't cheat by, I can't become a Lutheran minister and then become a priest if they see my baptism certificate I was baptized Catholic. Right. I'm trying to keep this shorter rather than longer. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No loopholes. There's no loopholes. <laughs> that's not fair. That's so bizarre. Well, I'm just saying what it is. Whether we like it or not, that's a whole other topic. Right? Just the facts, no opinion. Yeah. 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 That's, okay. yeah. yeah. Interesting. I'm going to take it for Could you be no. a man? I could. <laughs> but there's a lot of rumors that I am. Yeah. Okay. Could a man? Could a man um, have intercourse, have a child, not married, then want to then turn to the church, become a priest? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he's not celibate. Well, he has to be while he's a priest. The past is the we past. Allow, oh, yeah, okay. I'll give you an example. Okay, so like He's he called, says, the past I'll, I'll give you a, the, one of the most famous examples of that is St. Augustine. St. Augustine was shocked up with a woman for like 20 years. He had a son. His name is Adeodatus, which means beloved of God, ironically. Adeodatus, <laughs> Augustine had a son. And then Augustine converted, was baptized, became a priest, became a bishop, and became a saint. We believe in forgiveness. The church would, though, let's say, let's say I had a son or daughter like that. Let's say. <laughs> <laughs> the bishop would need to know that, and the bishop would also want to make sure that if I had an obligation for child support, that I would make sure that I keep my commitment to that, because I would have a moral obligation to pay child support. Right? But if I'm called to live, be a priest, and I've converted, become a Catholic, repented of my sins and my wild and holy ways, look, St. Augustine did that. And he's probably not the last one to do it either, because he lived in the third century, and there's a lot of centuries between him and us. Yeah. Can a sinner become a priest? Absolutely. Happens all the time. Don't forget, it's all about the conversion of the heart. Jesus wants us to change our heart. That's the good son. It doesn't matter how bad we were, if we realize we've been that bad of an individual, and all of a sudden we have an yeah. aha moment, go for it. Go it as happens, far as you it, can. It sometimes happens where some people that became priests were married, and the marriage was annulled, and they entered the seminary. It can happen, sure. But once you're ordained, you are celibate. But if you're a convert, because we want to convert those ministers to the Catholic Church, right? So in a way, the Church honors the fact that that person, as a Protestant, felt called to ministry, right? Now, we have to reordain them, but we still recognize that there was something in them felt called to ministry. And so they, they can become a Catholic priest if they convert. I know someone like that in the diocese. And still have more children. Well, yeah. They don't have to be abstinent, as far as I know. Yeah. Well, I never said abstinent, but I'm thinking... I don't know. Depends how you come in, so... Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. A priest is full-time. Can a deacon be full-time? I, I don't remember seeing any. Okay, well... Like it depends what you mean by full time and what you mean. Like you got your own business, but you're also a deacon. Right. So a deacon is ordained. We'll put it this way: a deacon is an ordained volunteer. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can write the bishop about that one. But anyway, but I'm not paid as a deacon. But if I was hired by the church for a, for a specific job. 
I'm paid as that job. And in a sense, a priest is too. For example, um, you know, uh, Father Marcel, now Bishop Marcel, uh, there was a point where he had three jobs. He was chaplain at St. Bonavis High School, he was vocation director, and he was something else. And between the three things that he was doing, it added up to full-time work. Right. But if he didn't have those three, he wouldn't be paid. So you're not paid only as a priest either. You're paid because you're pastor of, you know, Lorette Parish, or you're paid because you're chaplain at the hospital or whatever. So a deacon, if he had a job like that, where, um, you know, like for about, what is it, 10 years ago, uh, Deacon Ted was in charge of Holy Cross Parish because we were transitioning between pastors and there was no one to step in. And so the deacon was kind of overseeing, like you have the parish life directors, a deacon could do that too. And then they would be paid for that. Right. But you're not paid just because you ordained a deacon. But can a priest have another job, like, say, I don't know, working in a bookstore? Not, not usually. I, I'm not saying he can't. And it might depend on his bishop and what he likes. But you also could be, like, for example, there are religious orders that run uh, bookstores. There are religious orders that run publishing companies. You know? If I'm not mistaken, the Oblates in Canada own the Vallis. And the ones that make the Prion Eglise and then Living with Christ. That's owned by the Oblates, if I, if I remember right. I could be wrong on that. But like the Paulist Fathers, Paulist Press, uh, Loyola Press is run by the Jesuits. Ignatius Press is connected to the Jesuits. Um, religious orders can do those kinds of works. If you want to do that kind of work, probably your best bet is to find a religious order to be part of and do that kind of work. I see a lot of seminarian doing the deacon work at the church in the, in the parish class. Even before they're ordained a deacon? But part of that is because they're in training, right? And that's part of their, um, their internship, is to do some of that work, for sure. Yeah. So, for example, you could have a seminarian who's granted permission to preach on Sunday, and even though he's not ordained, but because he's training to be a priest, could do the homily. So there's a prerequisite to be a deacon, like there's a certain... Yeah, there's a certain amount of training that's done to be a deacon. And depending on the diocese, uh, there could be some variation as to what that is. It's not as much as a priest, it's less than. Uh, here in St. Boniface in Winnipeg, it's a five-year process. Mm -hmm. one, weekend, one weekend a month, uh, that type of, type of format. The, the new batch that's coming up now uh, is their, their academic requirements are much stronger than they were when I went through and even stronger than before me, the, the groups before me that were ordained. They're, they're kind of beefing it up a little bit, which is probably good. So they're actually taking some courses through the seminary by distance education uh, from, the, from uh, the seminary in Edmonton. They're taking like two or three or four courses in the course of the five years, or maybe more, uh, but online. Mm -hmm. so that's an added thing that we didn't go through ourselves. There must be some criteria, I'm not sure how to say it, like from the spiritual side or so on. Yeah. You just don't <laughs> let anyone try. No, just, there's a period of discernment. There's, there's, yeah, there is a process and you have your uh, internships and all that kind of stuff. It's like a mini seminary. So what the priest does only in a, in a, in an abbreviated form, because the priest, or a deacon rather, um, isn't meant to know everything a priest knows. Some deacons might, some deacons won't, or not necessarily, because a deacon is mainly ordained to be of service. More the practical side of things. The theological side would be more the priest. The priest would have more theological background and training than the deacon. Does a priest on have average. to nominate you to become a deacon? No. You, oh, okay. you, you know, if you feel called to be a deacon or you feel called to be a priest, 
you you talk to your pastor, who would then have you talk to the bishop. Bishop meets with you, and then you you move on the process through there, right? So you don't need nomination from the community, the Catholic community, or anything like that. It's not. No, not directly, but uh, but often it's it can be a sign if the community, uh, if you hear a lot of people in the community indicating to you that oh, I think you would make a good deacon or a good priest, you know, then um, then that could be one one of the pieces that helps you discern if people are telling you that and say, oh, well, I never thought of that myself, or maybe I should pray about it and see. But it's not the only determination. And in a sense, it comes from the people, yeah, sure, that they recognize a gift in somebody for that, for that ministry. Also, for a deacon who's married, you cannot be ordained uh, if your wife objects. It's even part of the liturgy of the ordination of a married deacon that, that in the Mass, the wife actually gives her consent, which obviously is a ceremonial representation of what she would have done a couple of years before while he's in the process. The bishop would meet with her and say, do you consent to this? Or do you feel you're going to be a, a deacon widow because he's going to marry himself to the parish and you'll never see him again? And if that's true, can you live with that? And if she has serious reservations, the, the bishop, if he has any brains in his head, will say to the guy, no, not at the expense of your marriage. I won't ordain you. Because even a deacon, his first vocation, if he's married, is to his family. Before his ministry to parish, his family should come first. At least I believe it should. Or it shouldn't, his family shouldn't suffer because of his ordination. Most of the deacons I know, and most of the time when people get ordained deacon, they are retired. They're done raising their kids. And so it, it's, it's, it's uh, like a second vocation. They had their family life, and now they want to do ministry. Uh, so then at, let's say, 60 or whatever years old, they'll be ordained into the priesthood. A lot of deacons were ordained. In, Winni in Winnipeg and St. Boniface, there were a lot that were ordained much older than a priest would at 25. And canon law even says 35 to be a permanent deacon. So Does the deacon have to answer to, directly to the local bishop? You bet. Yeah, okay. yeah. You're not, in, to be Catholic clergy, you must somehow fall in the chain of command. It cannot exist that you're a lone ranger. Even if you're a religious deacon? If you are a religious deacon, then you're in the chain of command of your religious order, which is in the chain of command of the church. But you always have a vow of obedience to somebody. There's always a chain of command, to use a military reference. But so you said 35 for a deacon? Yeah. Priest? 25. But for a permanent deacon, it's 35, because they want them, they assume that a lot of them will be married, and if you get married at 20, you want to have some time for your family. You don't want to have someone too young as a permanent deacon if they're married. So it's not 35 if you're a celibate? No, the law is 35. It doesn't make exceptions. They could change that, oh, okay. but the law is just lists, says 35. But part of it is because most of them are married. If they want to change the law and say, you know, another stipulation that if he's celibate he could be younger, but uh, they don't. So that, say somebody's like 24 in the process of training and they decide like maybe priesthood isn't for me and they say well even though you've gone through most of the process you've got to wait another 10 years before you can become a deacon even if, though you're at the age to become a priest? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> we have a beautiful system in the Catholic Church called dispensations. Because the age determined, 25, 35, whatever, okay, that's not, right. that's not in the Bible, that's not a Bible, but you know what I mean, it's not, in, it's not a divine law. No. Mm -hmm. It's not a, 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 
what they, yeah, it's not, it's not what they call a divine positive law. It's not something that God has expressly set. Okay, so it's completely man-made, admittedly so. It's not like there's no revelation that says, you must be, you know, that we can't do anything about. It's a recommendation. So, in that case, the laws would be that the bishop would still have to go to Rome and say, I have a candidate who went through the seminary, thought he was called to be a priest, but changed his mind and felt like, you know what, I really feel called to be a deacon, but I'm still called to be celibate, let's say. Okay? The bishop could present his case to whatever dicastery that fits that question, right? Fires that off to Rome. They could say yes, they could say no. But then the, the reply would come, let's say it's yes. Then the bishop could go ahead with the, with the ordination. Don't forget, a priest's job is a paid job. Deacons volunteer. Right. That goes a lot into your what to do. Well, no, but it's also a different kind of yeah. ministry. Well, yeah. I realize that, but yeah. if you're in the, if you become a priest, you know that financially there's, you got something to support you. Provided priest. you have a job as a priest. Yeah. The bishop has to put you in a parish, <clears throat> whatever. Sometimes you'll have priests where they're kind of, they're, they're in the chain of command, but they're, they're they're kind of sitting there doing nothing. Or whatever. Reading in the wings slowly. A priest in North America <laughs> sitting doing nothing. Maybe. <laughs> wow, we can't find a spot for you. Yeah. <laughs> You're not it would be player. very rare, yeah. but uh -huh. it, it, it usually goes hand in hand. But not just on the basis of him being ordained a priest. It's him being named to something that pays. He's not paid simply because yeah. he has father in front of his name. He's paid because he's a pastor of Lorette Parish. He's paid because he's a chaplain of a high school. He's paid because he teaches at a school. He's paid because he's a psychologist or whatever he does Teacher. as work. Mm -hmm. He gets paid for that. But if he's a priest and just, I don't know, whatever, if he's not in a parish and he says, Your Grace, I'm an author and I want to write books. The bishop says, Go ahead. You be an author. Write books. But you're on your own financially. You could do that, right? I think. But then he makes his own living that way. You know? Advantage of being a priest, though, is that, like in a diocese, for example, the diocese has a retirement pension for the priests. They don't for the deacons. We're on our own. And you're talking about a diocese and priest. The religious is part of the rift community and it kind of supports themselves. Well, yeah. When, when you belong to an order, you're taken care of till you drop. And even after, because they bury you too. Because yeah. everything you have belongs to everybody else, right? And like if you're in a religious order, most of, like the car that you drive isn't in your name. It's in the name of that religious order. But who cares? Right? You have a car. Right? Doesn't matter whose name is in, you know. Like if you're married and your car is put in your wife's name, so what? It's still the car you use to go home with, right? Ooh, it doesn't matter. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's her car. <laughs> or her truck. <laughs> so you said education goes into the decisions made later on. But a lot of priests have previous education outside of something maybe religious. Like you hear a lot about... Oh, scientists some, who in some priests cases or... people become priests later in life because they go into one field for a while and then have this call to to become a priest. So yeah, for sure. But does any of that? I, I don't want to use the word secular because we've already used it today. But does any like education outside of religious standards qualify them? Like if somebody, say, wants to be a bishop and they have a background in economics as compared to somebody who has a background in another field, mathematics, are they going to take that into consideration? I don't know because I've never been in, in on a meeting where they talk about who becomes a bishop. They might feel that someone with that kind of specialized knowledge might make a 
because the bishops, they not only are in charge of their own diocese, but they work together. Mm -hmm. Like the bishops of Canada work together as a Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops or the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops or whatever, right? And so they'll say they might want a bishop who, uh, who has some knowledge in maybe different fields so that when they get together, there's somebody in the room that knows something about that. Sure, that might be a consideration, you know, and they might balance it out. That as a college of, as a college of bishops in Canada or in a region, they have people of different gifts. Now, in the diocese, that might be not good because that bishop has this gift and not that gift, but then not everybody has everything, right? But as a community, they, you know, they, they probably look for these complementary gifts where someone might be an expert in liturgy. And some, because the bishops make, um, make statements about various issues, right? Mm -hmm. So having someone with some medical knowledge, right? So you might have a bishop who, who maybe went to med school and then changed to the seminary and has some knowledge. That would be useful, sure. Then you've got bishops who like to learn anyway, and they'll just keep going to school or whatever and learning different things at the same time. So yeah, you can have that too. We get back to the, the religious order question. Okay, so when somebody in the church starts, and I'll just deal with the orders of priests because this this is what we're talking about tonight. So you have a religious order that has priests. They might have priests only, or they might have priests and brothers. So there'll be men who are ordained, the priests, and then men that are not ordained, the, the brother. So for example, among the Jesuits, they'll have. Maybe most of them are priests, but they'll also have Jesuit brothers who are not ordained and don't, don't feel called to priesthood, but they're called to be a Jesuit. Um, or you have groups like, if you know Father John Cracker, the Marianists, you become a brother. Everybody is a brother. And in their order, they will select a few of their members to become priests. Whereas other religious orders, almost everybody is a priest depends on their, the particular order and their own specific way of doing things. And every order has its own flavor or its own history and spirituality, all approved by the church. You, if I'm starting a religious order, I'd have to first be approved by my bishop, then I'm approved by, let's say, a few bishops, and then I'm approved by the Vatican if I get really big. So an order like the Jesuit order, okay, has many more stages and a lot more uh, levels than an order like uh, Franciscans. Uh, I don't know the names of all the stages in, in the Jesuit formation. I know some of them, uh, some of the names, like there's one level called Regency, but I don't know what Regency is or what they do in Regency. I know that the Jesuit Novitiate, when they're a novice, to, before they take their first vows, the Jesuit novitiate is a two-year novitiate. Most uh, male communities have a one-year novitiate. So, Frère André is not a priest, right? No, hence the name Frère. He's a brother. A lot of Franciscans now, whether they're ordained or not, will go by the name Brother as a sign of humility, that both the ordained and, and, and the lay brothers uh, are called brothers in, among the Franciscans. So in the religious order, who does the ordinate, ordination? A bishop will always ordain somebody. Okay. So let's say, that, let's say a Franciscan community has a candidate for priesthood. Okay, So the superior of that community would write a letter to the bishop and say, Dear Bishop, you know, yeah, so and so wants to be a. We have this candidate ready for orders. He's done his seminary and his theology and all this stuff, and we would like you to ordain him. And then the bishop writes a letter and says, "I, I, you know, they worked that out." But the religious superior presents that candidate to the bishop because ultimately the bishop of a diocese is responsible for the ordinations that go on. So the Trappist. They fall under the Catholic Church. Right. So the Trappists are a monastic community, 
so they don't move around like a Jesuit would or a Franciscan would, right? So the, the Trappists are in a monastery, so that's a monk, right, because they're cloistered, okay? Now, some of the Trappists are ordained. Well, who ordains them? Who's the only one that can ordain them? A bishop, right? So, let's say there was a young Trappist. There isn't, but let's say there was, okay, and he did his seminary. Now, maybe he does a seminary in a his theology in a seminary or he does it all in the monastery. I don't know what they do. But he does all his studies, right? Then they would write a letter to Legat, right? Or a phone, but officially it would be a written document, right? <clears throat> you write a letter and you say, Archbishop, uh, we have this candidate uh, who has, uh, and you can't be ordained, if you're a religious order, you can't be ordained until you've taken your final vows. Because you have to be permanently established in that community. Because if you have your temporary vows, you could leave the community. So then, if you have temporary vows, you can't be ordained yet. You have to be, uh, like, <coughs> stable in your community, permanently a member in that community before you can be ordained. That's all in church law. So he's permanently, he's taken his final vows, he, he has taken his seminary, all that prerequisite stuff is done, write your letter to the bishop. The bishops will meet the communities in the course of their time, right? In the year they meet everybody. So they'll know who this is. You know, it's not a surprise. And then they say, okay. So they'll say, oh, well, sure, I will ordain. And then he'll write back and say, yes, I will ordain him on May the 1st, uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I will come to the monastery and ordain him. So the bishop doesn't have to ask the Vatican to ordain this individual. He can no. make a decision on his own. That's right. Okay. That's left up to the bishop. The only time there is an exception is like, for example, in the case of a married man who's a convert, mm -hmm. that has to go to the Vatican. At least that's what I'm told. It has to go to the Vatican. I heard a really cool story one time. There was a bishop up north, like in the Yukon or whatever, right, who had a convert. He was an Anglican. He became a Catholic. Wanted to become a priest, right? But, and so the file went to Rome, and it was sat there for like a year or two, right? and sat there and sat there, and the bishop was like getting antsy. So every seven years, every bishop in the world, like they take turns, and they all go to meet the pope. It's called the ad limina visit. So, so the bishop of the Yukon or wherever <clears throat> I was in the Vatican, and this is a number of years ago, and he was meeting, you get 10 minutes with the pope. I don't know what you choose to talk about in your 10 minutes of fame, right? So he had 10 minutes with the pope. Well, the bishop said, I've got a candidate. And it was Pope Benedict. I've got a candidate who's ready to be ordained. He's a convert from the Anglican Church. He's a married man, so he needs this dispensation because he's not celibate. And uh, it's in suspense, in bureaucracy land. Who knows where the file is, right? The Pope says, is he a good man? Yes. You, you like him? Yeah. You know, and all this? It's okay, one minute. Picks up the phone, blah, blah, blah. You know, hangs up. It's done. You can ordain him. If you know the Pope, you can cut through all the bureaucratic red tape. Piece of cake. I like that story, because Benedict could do that. He said, I am Benedict. You will do what I say. <laughs> this bishop wants his, get that file out and snip, snip, get to, get to work. Snip, snip, snip. Cuts the red tape. <laughs> German efficiency, right there. That's what you like. Time's up. Before I asked you, can can't the bishop then go to become a cardinal, and you're saying that's bringing him down, right? Well, no. If a, you asked if he was, when he retires, he's not interested in more work. Most people, when they are getting ready to retire, want to do less work, not more work. Yeah, but could he become a cardinal? Well, sure. The Pope names people cardinals. If the Pope wants to name someone who's retired a cardinal, he can do that. Because but you don't aspire to become a cardinal. At least you shouldn't be. At least Francis says you don't, you know, like hunger for it. That's yeah, but don't, doesn't the cardinals then become popes or bishops become popes? Well, among the cardinals, they vote for the guy that becomes a pope. Which is usually a cardinal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, among someone in the room gets elected pope. Right, so why Although would the bishop want to become cardinal so eventually he can become pope? No, because that's arrogance. You want to do God's will. Oh, so there's n they don't 
think like that. I'm sure some do. <laughs> <laughs> they're not supposed to think like no. that. But they're not supposed to think like yeah. that. They're just supposed to fill their order with whatever. I think if someone like craves to be Pope, they should see a shrink. They're power hungry. It's like, no, you don't want someone who craves the job. That's not Christ like. But isn't it some way good to become Pope? Then you can you can further help? Sure. But if God wants someone to be Pope, then you say as God wills. But you shouldn't like even Pope Francis has said over and over again in the three years that he's been Pope, stop this climbing the church corporate ladder. We're called to serve. You gotta remember a lot of saints weren't popes. And a lot of popes weren't saints. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? There's one that they just made the show out of. Who was exceptionally power hungry, had like four children. He was Pope well, if his last name was Borgia, for sure. That's yeah. one. <laughs> He's yeah. one of the most famous representations of, of somebody who was yeah. power-hungry. No, no, no. You don't want a power-hungry. But yeah. then in those days, the papacy was also a monarchy. Mm -hmm. Because the pope was also the king of the country called the Papal States. Right. But now there's no Papal States anymore. So it's shrunk to an acre, right, or whatever. And uh, so he's not king of anything <clears throat> anymore in terms of, like, politically. Uh, so that's why there was that kind of corruption. No, I think that, that anyone who is ordained should be called to serve the church. Now, when a young man desires to be a priest or a deacon, or an old man desires to be a priest or a deacon, right, it's, that's your call to serve. But to be a bishop, you're chosen, you don't even know you're going to be a bishop. You get a letter or a phone call uh -huh. randomly, and it's like, <laughs> out of the blue, you Can get a you call. Can you deny it? Yes, but because it's confidential, no one will ever tell you I was asked to be a bishop, and I denied it, because they can't say that they were asked. That's but they can deny it. They can, but that's, uh, uh, you're, a lot of pressure is on you. They shouldn't do that kind of pressure, because sometimes people uh, find it difficult to be a bishop, and, it, and I, know, yeah. I know at least one story where the, the, the priest who became a bishop, uh, the anxiety level and the stress level that went upon him mm -hmm. created a lot of depression for him and a lot of challenges mm -hmm. for him, and it was very, very difficult for him. Yeah. And it, it, it fried him in many ways because he just didn't feel right. And I think that his capacity to be free to say no might not have been there because the pressure might have been too great, I think. I know what that means, but if people are hungry, I'll feed them, right? That's very interesting. Yeah. I'll take one more question, if there's a question. No, we're all scared of rolling, that's why. <laughs> I like the power, Joe. <laughs> Cardinal Roland. Yes. Never be hope. There's <laughs> always hope. In theory, I've heard that when the cardinals get together, right, and they go in the conclave, they're locked in the room, right, and they, they uh, no cell phones and all that, and they hopefully pray, and they don't just, you know, throw dice to figure out who's the next pope. They can choose someone outside the room. I just don't know if they're not allowed cell phones or anything, how they would let that person know. But for hundreds of years, they've always chose someone in the room. No one, they, they stay, they're locked in there until they've chosen a pope, and they usually choose amongst each other. Don't they always have one person who's kind of assisting them? Like meals yeah, yeah, and... Yeah, teasing. There are, you know, obviously they have people, they, have to, be, they have to eat, right, and stuff like this, and, you know, whatever, there's little people who... Uh, help around and whatnot. So one of them would have to, you know, if they want to elect, uh, I don't know who, but, uh, you know, they would have to. I don't know how that person would get to Rome and come out on the balcony without anyone finding out, well, why are you traveling to Rome? You know, I don't know. So they just stick to the guys in the room, you know. But it'd be kind of funny to try that, you know, one time. Maybe, you never know, maybe they're in the room, they're saying, well, okay, what do you become? Well, I don't want to become Pope, it's too much. Mm -hmm. 
I yeah, know, they can, can say call. no. They can say no, of course. Hey, let's call Deacon Jill. <laughs> to Rome. We are not qualified. <laughs> <laughs> not in the least. I don't want my face in all these holy cards and plaques and calendars and fridge magnets and. But you sell more books. <laughs> you mean sell, you sell a more, not sell a bit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> Roll and Zancy. All right, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the ministries that are in the church, both the ministries of the ordained, of the bishop, the priest, and the deacon, but also the ministry that each of us as a baptizer are called to do. For all of us, Lord, have a role to play in the body of Christ. Help us, Lord, that whatever we're called to do, that we do it with love, with humility, and in a spirit of service. Pray that you bless us as, you, as we go home from this place, and help us always to grow more deeply in our love for you, in our trust in you, and in our hope that you are always with us. And Lord, we give you thanks for this day, and we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, except Roland, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Look what you did now. Yeah. <laughs> I found the button. <laughs> A portion of the lecture was missed due to cameraman error. This is his apology and recap of what may have been missed. The Hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church We start with Head of the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. Cardinals. Cardinals are a group of bishops who elect the Pope and often hold advisory or leadership positions in the Vatican. They are usually appointed by the Pope. Archbishops. The leader of several dioceses or very large dioceses. Bishops, the leader of a diocese, a collection of parishes. Priests, an ordained minister and spiritual leader of a parish. Deacon, an ordained minister who assists parish priests. And last but not least, laity, baptized Catholics members of the Catholic Church. The Hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Thank you.